Hello everyone, and today I'm going to give you a review of this 2013 Volvo V60 D6 plug-in hybrid. Oh, Sveria, the land of minimalist furniture, culture-shaping pop music, and quality motors. Originally founded in 1927, Volvo was built on the very concept of safety. To quote its two founders, cars are driven by people. The guiding principle behind everything we make at Volvo, therefore, is and must remain safety. The modern three-point seat belt, the rear-facing child seat, and the side and curtain airbags are only some of the safety features that Volvo went on to develop and implement. This V60 came out in 2010 and was facelifted in 2014. It is essentially an estate version of the S60, sitting between the smaller V50 and larger V70, both discontinued shortly after in favour of the new V40 and V90 respectively. Now, back to our D6 twin engine plug-in hybrid. Let's break it down step by step. This car is powered by two independent systems, a 5-cylinder diesel capable of outputting 215 horsepower and 414 newton meters of torque to the front wheels only via a conventional 6-speed automatic gearbox. Meanwhile, the rear wheels are spun by a 70 horsepower electric motor that is fed by an 11 kilowatt hour battery located underneath the boot floor. The V60, being a plug-in, benefits from a Type 2 charging port located on the driver's front wing. In my experience, it's a little picky and won't accept all city chargers, especially high current ones. Charging to full takes about 3.5 hours and in turn provides you with about 55 kilometers of claimed pure electric charge, allowing you to benefit from various government schemes such as avoiding low emission zone, charges in London or using bus lanes and free city parking gear in Lithuania. Finished in metallic black, this V60 presents itself in a minimalist yet smart and elegant look. As you can see, the roof and the window lines taper off gently towards the rear, which speaks sports and velocity. However, it does sacrifice boot space. And also this flared shoulder line, which runs from the front headlight all the way down to the rear, makes the car appear visually lower. And this is quite a distinct feature of all the Volvos of this era which is in contrast to the older, more boxy Volvo estates of the past, which had a more utilitarian feel to them. The front houses the optional bison and headlights, featuring the cornering function, simply amazing during evening drives on narrow, winding country roads. A bit of trivia. The meaning behind the Volvo's symbol is nothing to do with male. This is the old Greek alchemy symbol for iron. Why? because the first Volvos were made to cope with Sweden's harsh winters. The rear is quite well designed too, with a curved LED taillights, sparingly used chrome, which I actually find looks quite good in my opinion, and the D6 exclusive exhaust tips, which are, thank God, real for once, unlike the plasticky rubbish that you find on some new luxury cars. <laughs> Volvo is, after all, all about attention to detail, and it really shows. After all, authenticity, does make a car look a lot more premium than a 20 inch iPad for the dashboard. Take note manufacturers. The interior is generously wrapped in cream leather, accented by brushed aluminium, once again signifying that despite having close to 300 horsepower, this D6 is all about luxury and comfort rather than raw speed. The boot floor is raised by 60mm to accommodate the battery and combined with a sloping roof, it's far from biggest in its class, falling behind the competitors like Audi A4 or BMW 3 Series. However, extra cargo space can be unlocked with the rear seats folded down. Now, the rear seats, speaking of, offer good headroom, but I wouldn't say the legroom is very adequate, that's me sitting behind myself as a driver. It's, it's okay. Now you've got your armrest here, which 
comes at the sacrifice of the middle seat that comes with two nice handy cup holders. Oh. Now as for the front, this is where all the action happens. Now Volvo did what Volvo does absolutely best and came up with some class leading front seats. Now they balance cushioning and comfort very well. There is a decent amount of support around the sides and apart from being heated these seats are also electrically adjustable in almost every possible way and there is also memory function for three drivers as standard i know this is a rental so i won't be able to test it out but i do believe that each key can be mapped to an individual driver now the floating center console can look a little intimidating at first with this vast array of buttons but i assure you it's actually quite intuitive once you get a hang of it got all your controls for the subsystems, navigation, radio, media, telephone, etc. The alphanumeric keyboard to use with the navigation and the phone, as well as the dual zone climate control. And I actually find Volvo's labeling quite easy to grasp. This is where the air blows in relation to you as the driver, the head, the body, and the feet. And to be fully honest with you, I do prefer the physical button interface over the touchscreen base ones. I don't know, it's, it's just that the feedback, the ease of use while driving, I prefer this. Sometimes simpler is better. By default, the car starts in the hybrid mode where it acts like any other hybrid, utilizing electric motor at low speed or low loads and firing up the engine at higher speeds. The indicator on the dashboard shows the accelerator load versus the threshold at which the diesel engine will take over. The threshold varies with things such as speed and battery charge. So far my experience has been that the car switches between electric and diesel in quite a seamless fashion without any noticeable jerking. We've also got the pure mode, where as the name suggests, the car will attempt to run exclusively on battery power, provided of course it's got the range. You know, 70 horsepower doesn't sound like a lot on the paper, however you must remember it's an electric motor, so all of the 200 newton meters of torque are available from standstill. The ride is exceptionally quiet, but that's also, however, because the computer kills any non-essential loads, such as the air conditioning, to extend the range. The pure mode copes well not only with city driving, but also out-of-town commutes at speeds approaching 100 km an hour. And of course, higher speeds will reduce your range. Should you wish to charge your batteries while driving to make use of the pure mode later, such as when entering a low emission zone, the save mode will use the diesel engine to charge your batteries to about 40% to give you about 15 kilometers of range. Do be mindful though that the performance is compromised as the diesel engine must work hard to propel both you forward and charge the batteries. And of course, this does heavily affect the fuel consumption. Now, selecting power mode is where you can expect to see the greatest change in terms of the driving dynamics and I can already feel the accelerator becoming a lot more responsive. The electric motor kicks in and the diesel engine is standing by at higher RPMs waiting to unleash all of its 285 horsepower at your disposal. This mode is good for overtaking or generally more spirited driving and it truly unlocks that sweet sweet burble of the 5 pot. Oh yeah, of course, driving in this mode is where the car is the least merciful in terms of the fuel consumption, driving the average is up to about 8.1 litres per 100 kilometres. Of course, compare that with the 1.6 that I managed uh, to achieve in the hybrid mode over a 50 kilometre stretch of mixed roads, and that was with a fully charged battery and a wise use of gentle acceleration and regenerative braking. Despite the extra weight of the hybrid drivetrain, 285 horsepower is sufficient to launch you from 0 to 60 in a rather swift 6.1 seconds. The engine copes well with acceleration demand, comfortably and quickly getting up to speed to overtake another vehicle or join the main road and does so in a very smooth linear fashion. Feels quite refined. The suspension on this V60 was made for comfy cruising. It filters out most of the road bumps with ease 
However, it wasn't made for any serious truck shredding because it definitely has a degree of softness to it. However, in terms of body roll, it's definitely far from an old Cadillac. On the road, this wagon feels very solid and just sticks to the road super well, even on a narrow roads at higher speeds. It just takes little effort to point it where you want it to go. However, you just can't not notice the heaviness of it while driving it. It clocks in at just 12 kilograms shy of two tons. 1,988 kilograms this compact estate weighs and it is almost identical weight-wise to the Volvo's flagship SUV, the XC90, and it's really evident when you're trying to do a bit more spirited driving. In terms of tech and safety, this car boasts a fairly generous list of equipment. Starting with the sat-nav, despite being over 10 years old, it's still fairly intuitive to use with the alphanumeric keyboard. You also have the Bluetooth connectivity with a full streaming capability. The premium sound speaker system delivers a very enjoyable listening experience with a good range throughout all the frequencies. However, I must criticize the cruise control system of this V60 that feels a little underdeveloped. Now, most modern premium cars, when you select a lower speed, the electronic brake is applied slightly to reduce the speed as selected. This Volvo even has the option of using the regenerative braking, which is even simpler. However, this V60, especially when going down the hill, just has a real tendency to pick up the speed and it takes a real while to get back to its selected speed, leaving you to apply the brake yourself, which in turn deactivates the cruise control, then you have to reapply it again and you get me, a lot of fuss. Now, I have to say because of the sheer size of the bonnet, and because it does sit quite high, it does take a little while of getting used to parking this car, especially because the view on the opposite side of the driver is blocked by high windows. Um, however, it's a good thing that it does come with two sets of parking sensors, one in the front and one in the rear. It does also come with a backup camera. However, for some reason during daytime, it doesn't work, but it works during nighttime and I have no idea why. See? In terms of safety, this V60 comes with pedestrian detection and automatic braking which helps to aid in avoiding low speed rear end collisions. This motor is absolutely packed with active safety systems and airbags allowing it to achieve a 5 star NCAP rating. Overall to summarize, the reason why the V60 never really took off to revolutionize the world, the answer is simple. Largely owing to the complexity of the drivetrain, it's the cost. At over £50,000 brand new in UK, before the options, it was simply too much for most families. The reason why diesel hybrid combination never proved to be popular, once again, the answer is complexity and cost. Petrol engines simply work better in tandem with electric motors. Nonetheless, the V60 genuinely is a one-off kind of a car in its class. It's a high-quality blend of performance and comfort, it feels premium and well-built. It provides enough electrical range for an average commute to work, which is superb especially if you have access to free charging. However, being in a state, I am quite disappointed with its rather unimpressive space, in addition to being heavy and on the lazier side in terms of handling. Despite of its shortcomings though, I cannot but admire Volvo's efforts to venture into the uncharted worlds of diesel hybrids, making one visually inconspicuous but a truly unique family estate. Once again, thank you very much for watching. This is Adam G. Goodbye.